And the point is that you can see how beautiful these Kepler data are. You wouldn't normally think of raw data like this being aesthetically pleasing, but I find this gorgeous. Uh, and, and you can see why. This beautiful dimming, you can smell the planet crossing in front of the star, and then the planet you know, crosses over the star, and then the planet emerges from the star with that slope there. You can, you can just s almost visualize the planet just by looking at the brightness data. It's amazing. Now, there's more, of course. The amount of dimming tells you how big the planet is. And in this case, the dimming, as I say, is 0. 0.00015 of the normal brightness, 1.5 parts per 10,000. And that immediately tells you the size of the planet turns out to be 40% uh, bigger than the Earth, 1.4 Earth radii. And by the way, that is the world's record. This is the smallest planet ever found, still to this day, uh, validated, confirmed around another sun-like star. This is the smallest one. It's not exactly the size of the Earth, but it is obviously tantalizingly close to a planet that has the same size, or nearly the same size, as our own planet Earth. Uh, that's amazing in and of itself, uh, but there's more. And, and I'll show you a little bit more. Here is the summary so far. We watched a planet cross in front of the star by measuring the brightness of the star as seen in the lower graph. But we can also make Doppler measurements of the star, the host star itself. Why in the world would you want to make Doppler measurements, measure the Doppler shift of the light waves? Well, the reason is, if you measure Doppler shifts of the star, you can tell whether the star is coming at you or going away from you. You all know the Doppler shift. For those of you who are not big-time scientists, you, you know that the train whistle changes its pitch when the train goes by you. Ooh. So it, even with your eyes closed, you can tell the Doppler shift is uh, sending a signal to your brain that the train is either approaching or receding. And so it is with light waves from a star. You can tell whether a star is approaching us at the Earth or receding. Why would a star wobble around like that? Well, because it's being yanked on gravitationally by this supposed planet. As the planet goes around the star, it pulls on the star gravitationally, and you see the star respond for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. So we should see the Doppler shift vary, just like a sort of a, a police uh, officer monitoring the, the speed of the star with a radar gun. And here's, in fact, the graph of the speed of the star over the course of time, and you can see the star did change its velocity upward and then downward and then upward again, this star indeed is being yanked around by its little planet, even though it's only 1.4 Earth radii, just as you would have predicted. And that tells us the mass of the planet, because of course the more mass of the planet, the more strongly it yanks gravitationally on the star. And you can use Newton's laws of physics, and you get 4.5 times the mass of the Earth, bulk mass of the Earth. So now we know two things about this planet. Its size in radius and its mass based on the Doppler measurements. And if you put those two together, you can determine, therefore, the density of the planet. Remember, mass of an object divided by the volume of an object is density. And in this case, we get 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, at first, that doesn't mean a thing to me. But if you think back to your high school chemistry days, can you remember your high school chem? My, my high school chemistry teacher said, remember one thing. Water has a density of one. One gram per cube. It's about all I can remember from high school chemistry. But 
that's pretty good because this planet has 8.8 .8 times that density. And indeed, the planet Earth, our planet Earth, has a density of 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is a planet slightly more dense even than our planet Earth. And so it's surely a solid planet, indeed a planet made of material that's slightly more dense than our solid planet Earth. It is a rocky planet, the first definitively rocky planet, I would suggest, ever found around a sun-like star. We've depicted it uh, as seen here, a solid planet. Uh, we know its mass, radius, and density. We've given it a little reddish tinge because perhaps the higher density is partly due to a, a higher than average admixture of iron and nickel, the, the heavier elements that would give it the higher density. And we've even uh, constructed a, a movie, or at least NASA has, so here's a, a little uh, animated movie of what we think the star and its planet looks like. There you see the planet in uh, silhouette, the thing that blocked one part in 10,000 of the light of the star. One side of the planet is blowtorched by the star because remember this planet is so close to its star. It's very hot, about 1500 degrees Celsius. And on the back side, it's frigid cold because the back side of the planet is just looking out into the black, cold darkness of the universe. And then NASA has put in some white flecks of snow for reasons I have no idea. <laughs> What's the orbit of the planet? What's the size of the orbit? It's uh, about one fiftieth the size of the Earth's orbit. 150th the Earth's orbit around the sun. And you can see that the animators at NASA have watched too much Star Wars. <laughs> but it's a solid surface for sure. Maybe it has plate tectonics, uh, maybe volcanism because it's so hot on the surface. It would be extraordinarily wonderful to someday send a spacecraft and get close-up pictures to find out what such a scorched, rocky world might actually be like. So that's what we think Kepler-10 looks like.